Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in this presentation. I am uh, Jeroen Janssen. I'm an associate director at Tonda Tomasetti in our London office, and I'm part of Core Studio, uh, which is our global research and development team. And today I'd like to show you a little bit about, about one of our applications we developed uh, in-house called Swarm. So a little bit of background. Um, I mean, as we we all know our industry today operates with never increasing number of constraints, right? Most large scale projects, they spend a great deal of effort tackling problems like energy efficiency, environmental sustainability, structural optimization, and so on and so forth. Combine that with the undying human need to have your cathedral just that bit much taller and a little bit much curvier than your neighbor. And you get the general 21st century architectural sensibility that looks like something like the projects on this slide. Now, the prob problem of that is, of, of designing these things, is that these require often very sophisticated tools. And I say sophisticated tools, but actually in the background, they often look like this. And don't get me wrong, I'm, we all love Grasshopper, but when you begin to design, um, when, <clears throat> sorry, when you begin to task designers with exponentially more complex computational projects, you inevitably deprive them from focusing on the actual questions of design. So that's why we see many of the advanced teams, they kind of organically separated between designers on one hand, who, who spend countless hours on delivering a project, satisfying all of these innumerable constraints, and then the computational specialists on the other side, who build tools and create workflows that in fact make that all possible. And when that comes to a large project, Generally, what we see happening is, is something like um, the computational specialists spend the hundreds, hundreds of hours building these project-specific tools. And actually, that's only half of the battle, right? Because once that's done, the following stage is actually distribution. So getting the design team to use all of that stuff that we've all been building for these weeks. And as many of you know, that's not always easy, right? A lot of uh, designers are not comfortable with Grasshopper and completely understandable. It's not their domain expertise, actually. So in our opinion, the ultimate goal is to actually let the designers be designer and the computational specialist be computational specialist. Because at the end of the day, when the deadlines kick in, stress levels go up, the designer realizes that they barely have time to sleep, let alone learn this new tool. The workflow turns into a classic case of, hey, could you could you just do this together with me? And at that point, it's the computational specialist pulling all nighters alongside the design team together. And it's really not being efficient. And on top of that, the sad part is that all of these grasshopper definitions at the end of a project, they really get filed away deep into the network drive and actually never see the light of day again. And that's a pattern we've seen many, many times across our own company, but also uh, beyond outside. And I'd like to give you a little bit of a snapshot of how at Core Studio we've been trying to solve this throughout the years. So it really started back in 2012 when we worked on a project called Remote Solving. And that really was connecting design models and analysis models through the clouds between two computers. And it allowed project partners to use bespoke engineering tools remotely. Following on from that in 2015, we got up to Platypus, which is a tool that allows grasshopper definitions on the left, stream uh, the geometry to the web on the right-hand side in real time. So you could really share 3D views of your models while you are still tweaking it. Then in 2018, we came up with Asterisk, which is a structural engineering tool uh, based on a set of machine learning algorithms. And people really like this, but as that started to be used on real project, actually, the more Diggy asks for crucial updates and features came along. And to be fair, Asterix was a bit of a beast. So it was hard to implement new stuff. And it wasn't always that fast and easy anymore. Fast forward a bit further to 2018, McNeil released Rhino Inside and the Compute Technologies. And in one of our AC hackathons um, in the end of 2018, I think, we built a prototype of a, of a system for 
remote solving grasshopper definitions in the cloud and then presenting it back into the web browser. And following this hackathon, actually, this conversation kept on going on uh, about the remote solving. And based on the experience of these projects that we've just presented, um, we could see a big value in that internally. But we also started to discuss and analyze the market um, and the opportunities outside of Thornton Tomasetti, and more importantly, even outside of the AC industry. So we got together again and we wanted to create a system that would allow computational specialists to build, deploy, and share apps to the designers. And that's what I want to introduce you today is Swarm, uh, our newest application in all of this journey. And Swarm really is an app store for the design community. So the concept there is to really connect designers who need the tools and super users who are building them on the, on the other hand. And from a technical point of view, Swarm really encapsulated Grasshopper definitions into small, clean, shareable and cross-platform apps. And an integral part of Swarm is the marketplace. So this would be the landing page uh, where you, you would find and share apps. So you can search for them. Apps can either be private, shared with specific users or within your organization. And they can also be public, which means they're available for anyone to install and run. Either for free or with a price tag, depending on the author's uh, preferences, really. So to run an app, you basically start off with finding it. In this case, the tower generator and click install. That's all. Once that's done, you can then run the app from any of our Swarm plugins. In this case, we're showing the Rhino plugin. So on the right-hand side, each app is presented with a condensed and simple user interface. You recognize the sliders to actually change geometry, et cetera. And as a user, you configure these inputs, hit run, and you get your results back into the viewport straight away. And obviously, the designer doesn't need to know anything about Grasshopper to be able to actually run the Swarm app. One technical but rather important detail uh, to mention in this context is that actually the underlying Grasshopper definition is not solved on the user's local machine. It's actually all of the inputs and instructions. They are bundled up into a package, send off to our servers, uh, solves the definition, and then it returns the outputs back to the user. What this means is that Swarm actually doesn't have to be run from inside of a Rhino document. It can also run, for instance, as you see here, the web client. Um, and our main focus has been desktop clients, since that's the natural place where engineers tend to do most of their work. Um, but the web app actually turned out to be quite awesome and actually opens up many opportunities as well. So we've been developing over the time quite a few other plugins. So on the left hand side, you see a Revit implementation. And on the right on the right hand side, you see uh, an Illustrator prototype, which we're actually pretty excited about. So that really brings the 3D models into the 2D world of, of Illustrator. And really what we hope as a community uh, that computational design can be leveraged into all of these other communities and practices. Now, since we probably have quite a few computational specialists on the, on the call today, I believe we wanted to give you a quick overview of what it means to actually build a Swarm app. Uh, so you should see it on the video here. So you basically open up a Grasshopper definition. Uh, they can be relatively small, they can be large, doesn't really matter. Um, the next step then is to indicate what are the inputs and what are the outputs, um, which you can do with that one component that was just added as part of our Grasshopper uh, Swarm plugin. You give these inputs a name and then you hit the upload button on the right hand side and that sends the app to the marketplace and that's all. So once that's uploaded, it can then be found in your account and you can actually go in and edit the app, give it some description, add some images, etc. At first, it will only be visible to the author, um, but then you can actually change the visibility as you like. So you can change it to go to a public app 
uh, invite specific users and even let the users allow to uh, download the original Grasshopper definition if you like. We've made a big effort in actually making Swarm as hackable as possible. So if you wonder if we do have an API, I do have some good news for you. Yes, there is. Um, and the great thing about building on top of Swarm API is that since you're actually constructing your business logic of your application in Grasshopper, the time that it takes you to prototype and deploy the tools is actually cut down dramatically. So we've been ex experimenting with this in-house. So here you see two applications, uh, two examples of, of some of the applications we deployed in-house. Uh, on the left is a column design app, uh, which runs within Revit. And it's a, it's a tool that helps our engineers to calculate tributary, area, uh, tributary areas of columns. And actually in the background, this runs a grasshopper definition with a Voronoi um, component, giving you back these, these areas. On the right-hand side, a prototype of a framing repair, which runs in our construe interoperability platform. Again, a grasshopper definition in the background, uh, reading the inputs, doing the computation, and then getting it back. And this really actually drops the development time from, I don't know, days, weeks, almost months back to hours. Because um, really, you only need to know Grasshopper in the, in the back end. Another example here is, uh, I mentioned the asterisk uh, optioneering tool in the beginning. We got that embedded within Swarm as well. So you, you see three different flavors of asterisk here for specific different end user needs. And again, this took a matter of days to actually set it up rather than the months it took us for the web app, the original asterisk web app. And quickly here showing another flavor of that asterisk app, but now inside of Revit. So instead of just simple geometry, you can actually consume and bake BIM elements straight into your Revit model um, and have them ready for uh, populating. But we're not there yet. So expanding to other platforms is some, certainly something uh, which is still on the horizon. So we have it working right now in Rhino, Grasshopper, Revit, Prototype in Illustrator, and some of our uh, structural analysis softwares as well, like SAP and ETABS. Uh, but we're also thinking outside of the AC industry. So um, whatever workflows we can, we can handle. But really, I think the important part here is this idea of the marketplace. So to bring that back there, because that really captures the vision of Swarm as an open platform, allowing designers, creators, computational specialists from multiple disciplines freely to share, exchange, and actually use these, these powerful design tools. And it provides both a way to put your work out there as free and open source apps or be compensated for it, which we hope will support more intense and more involved development. But really, all we offer is the vision and the tech. It really needs a community to, to build now and actually take this forward. So we're really excited about that. And finally, what I wanted to add is that we announced last year that we merged Swarm with ShapeDiver. Um, we're still really excited about that. So ShapeDiver started off as um, really an e-commerce platform on, uh, embedded within websites and Swarm is coming from the AC industry and workflows. But we really believe this combined product will be flexible enough to empower all sorts of parametric designers within many industries. So we've been actually working hard in the background the past few months to merge these platforms more from a technolo technolo uh, technological point of view. Um, and we probably come out with in a month or two or three uh, with more news where Swarm is actually will be integrated within ShapeDiver. So please keep an eye on this space and, and watch that. And that's really all there is to say for now. Uh, please get in touch. Tell us how you would use or want to try Swarm, um, et cetera. Do you want to build projects? More than happy to. Um, I'd like to give credit as well to my colleagues, Sergey and, and Emil. They've been really pushing uh, this, this forward. Um, 
and that's that's it for me so all exciting stuff so please come and talk to us and let me know if you have any questions comments that's all welcome you're welcome thank you very much fantastic i'm sure there's a lot of excitement from people watching about that um i, I hope so sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I have no doubt. I have no doubt. Um, excellent presentation. Um, I've got a couple of questions, um, so we'll, we'll dive right in. Uh, the first one, um, somebody says they could imagine that the marketplace could become quite crowded. How is it curated um, and is there a, an easy way to find apps within the Swarm ecosystem? Good question. So at the moment, it's um, the marketplace itself is not uh, curated as such. Um, maybe if it grows, we need to, yes. Uh, but let's not go into the Facebook uh, moderate <laughs> moderation topics here. Um, so at the moment we're, we're still sort of in beta. So it's it's um, anyone within Tonto Tomasetti plus a whitelist, let's say. So everyone who's, who signs up and is invited can actually post apps. And then it's up to the user uh, how visible they are, if they're fully pu uh, public, fully private, or shared within your organization, let's say. So um, yeah, you just type keywords and you find your apps basically. That's that's kind of how it works. Okay, so sort of similar sort of style to how like put the Apple App Store style of finding you in the App Store, but without the without the moderation process on the that's, top of it. Huh? That's really the example. Yes, exactly. Okay, yeah. okay, excellent. Okay, awesome. All right, second question. Um, well, the questions are coming in fast here. So, just to the audience's perspective, uh, you might some of these will probably you can follow up with um, your own afterwards because I probably won't get through all of these before the next session starts. But um, absolutely, any any thoughts on how data privacy and data sovereignty will be managed for data being passed to and from the Swarm servers? How does Thornton Tomasetti manage that data that's on the Swarm servers? I suppose is the question. Good question. Um, I don't know the full 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 details i'll mm -hmm. i'll admit that straight away um but basically it's been packaging up and actually uh part of that is really uh being accelerated now with the merger of shape diver so that actually encapsulated uh, its own file format uh, so it's an encrypted binary file format so the, the definition with all of the inputs and geometry gets packaged up send off to um it solves on amazon on an aws uh, mm -hmm. client um, solves there and send back with the same file format. So, um, yeah, we need to look at it. I, I know we're looking at it, but I don't know the full details. I, I'm, I'm sure it's okay. encrypted and safe. Um, okay, awesome. That's fine. Um, interesting question here. Can the Grasshopper definitions, uh, which it's in brackets they've put, which become the apps, contain third-party Python modules such as NumPy, TensorFlow, um, and therefore still be made available on the Swarm marketplace? Yes, but if you have ideas, get in touch because um, in reality, what actually happens is that that client on the Amazon side just needs that uh, third-party app installed as well, right? So okay. if if it's installed on that Amazon client, then yes, it can run uh, through Swarm. Okay. So okay, yes, cool. it basically can. Uh, right, last question then. Um, the notorious problem someone's put with the DAG parametric models um, is the lack of flexibility and scalability, which, which makes changes difficult to be implemented in the custom tools developed by independent developers. How does this swarm, how does swarm respond to this problem? I, I think maybe I'm misunderstanding the question, but I think it's coming at it from the perspective of, of how, can, how do people ensure that their apps on swarm will be scalable and, you know, uh, easy to modify. Maybe I've misunderstood that, but that's how I understand it now. Well, that's that's really kind of the ongoing question, right? Like, are you building that massive big grasshopper definition that does the whole building design from front to end? Or, and I'm actually seeing more and more of that by chunks, small, small, uh, small chunks. And that's also how I see the power of Swarm. So you could actually, um, Swarm actually lives within grasshopper as well, right? So I could see a workflow where you have actually a sequence of smaller Swarm apps. Let's mm. say um, get an architect's model and get structural center lines. Then from those structural center lines, get your floor design in terms of base. From mm. the floor design, then get the sizing done. These could be three, four different apps, uh, almost daisy chained together. And okay. giving the level of, of experience of the actual uh, end user, 
that could also be done differently, right? So that could be in starting off in Revit, app mm. one, app two is in Rhino maybe, and uh, does something, app three in Rhino as well. So bake your outputs to Rhino, take that as an input to the uh, swarm app number three, and number four maybe lives in the structural software. Or if you're actually Grasshopper uh, adapt, that could actually be a daisy chain inside of one Grasshopper definition. Okay. So you can actually download the Swarm apps as a component in a way. Very interesting. Um, okay, last question. We've got we've sort of overrunning slides next session. So just hopefully these last two questions will be sort of one or two word answers. Um, but is TT Core Studio still actively developing Construe? Yes. Okay. And <laughs> any plans to extend the store to incorporate .NET libraries? Or can it already do that? Good question. No, it can I don't think it can. Uh, okay. But I think that's certainly something we should look into. Pick up. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's been fantastic. Honestly, I really enjoyed that, Yaron. Thank you so much for Great. your for your presentation. Um, thank you again to the audience for the, the questions. If you've got any further questions that I've not got to, please reach out to Yaron independently um, or catch him in the networking session at some point if he's available tomorrow. Everybody else, and I'll see you all in the panel discussion in, uh, immediately. <laughs> see you later. Bye -bye. Thank Cheers. you. Bye-bye.